So this one is naturally aspirated. I can guarantee we can get over 400. If we wanted to put a supercharger on that, maybe we get five or 600 horsepower. I am not interested in supercharging. In a small workshop in regional Victoria, a man who had spent decades in the shadows of world-class racing decided to build something the motorcycle world had not seen before, a road-legal V8 superbike born from obsession, ingenuity, and a stubborn refusal to accept limits. Paul Maloney spent years working for top-level teams, wrenching in British superbike paddocks, leaning over engines in MotoGP, learning the language of high performance. He carried those lessons home. The idea started as a sketch. Two engines married together, an improbable noise, and an impossible grin on the face of anyone who heard it. I wanted something that made you feel small when you sat on it. Something that sounded like a race car but behaved like a bike. It was personal, something to prove to myself. The plan was audacious. Two Yamaha R1 inline force would be combined to form a 90 degree V8. The technique was part art and part brutal engineering. Maloney used blocks and heads from proven engines, but nearly everything else had to be rethought. The transmission had to be inverted so both engines could drive a single output. Custom crankcases, a purpose-built crankshaft, and an electronic brain calibrated by hand were only the start. The result was a 1,996 cubic centimeter V8 with 40 valves working like an orchestra. At higher revs, the note was savage and pure, closer to a 1970s Formula One car than a motorcycle. Fueling came from individual throttle bodies and a race-grade ECU, tuned to keep the engine singing as one. The engine dictated the geometry. Maloney built a jig, placed the power plant in it, and measured. A chrome moly trellis in the front, a machined aircraft-grade aluminum subframe in the rear, carbon body panels to hide and to breathe. He repurposed what worked, like the Yamaha swing arm, but re-engineered linkages and points of stiffness until the handling matched the engine's intensity. Nothing on the bike was second-rate. The suspension was fully adjustable Olin's. Brakes were Brembo. Wheels were Marcassini forged units, wrapped in sticky rubber. A titanium Akrapovich exhaust kept weight down and made the V8 sing with a sharp, metallic timbre. Weight was shaved where possible, but this was never going to be a featherweight. The trade-off was power and character. The thing that surprises you is how usable it is. You think a V8 motorcycle would be a handful, but the engineering hides the mass when you ride it. Then you open the throttle and the grin is permanent. The numbers impressed reviewers and skeptics alike. The PGM produced numbers few road bikes achieve. It made over 300 horsepower at the output and more than 200 newton meters of torque. Those figures translated into a machine that could accelerate like a rocket and cruise with composure at highway speeds. Yet the achievement was more than horsepower. It was the harmony between systems. The clutch had to be light enough for urban traffic, the gearbox precise for rapid shifts, the fuel mapping smooth enough for everyday rideability. Maloney used the experience he had gathered in racing to iron out weak points to ensure the engine's internals were strong enough for the task. The public debut was modest and deliberate. At a classic motorcycle meeting on a famous Australian circuit, Maloney rolled his creation into the light and people stopped. Photographers leaned in, Journalists scribbled. Enthusiasts crowded around like pilgrims at a rare relic. The first rides were cautious, then exhilarated. Reporters who had seen Exotica in factories and prototypes called it a miracle of backyard engineering. It felt like something that should not exist, except it did. It was both civilized and ferocious. The craftsmanship was uncompromising. Critical voices noted the obvious compromises. At roughly 242 kilograms wet, this was not a small bike. It demanded respect. It required skill. But the geometry, the suspension tuning, and the massive torque curve made it surprisingly manageable in corners. 
Stability came from the wheelbase and rake that were chosen with intent, not aesthetics. The cost, as expected, matched the ambition. These motorcycles could not be mass-produced without losing their soul. Each unit was handmade, built to order, taking thousands of hours. A price tag placed them in the realm of collectors, serious enthusiasts, and those for whom cost was a detail in the face of something unique. You do not buy this bike for the resale value, you buy it because you want to own an idea, something beautifully executed and rare. For Maloney, the PGM was never just a product, it was a statement. He could have worked for larger manufacturers, poured his energy into a safer, more marketable concept, but he chose to chase an ideal instead. The result was a machine that generated headlines and conversations. It revived the notion that individuals, with skill and passion, can still shift the boundaries of motorcycle design. There were practical benefits to Maloney's approach. By using existing proven engine architecture as the core, he reduced unknowns. He applied race-proven solutions where necessary and custom solutions where nothing existed. Because components were high quality, long-term reliability suffered less than it might have in a more cavalier project. It is a creative proof of concept. You see two engines becoming one, and it tells you what is possible when constraints are embraced rather than feared. Over time, the PGM moved into the hands of collectors and occasional riders. It turned up at shows and small press events and in videos that spread its legend. The motorcycle market, ever practical, did not adopt a V8 renaissance. Yet the PGM earned a place in history as a machine that dared more than it needed to, and succeeded on its own terms. I do not think about numbers anymore. I think about the people who come up and say, it made them want to get back on a bike. That is enough. The PGM 2.0 liter V8 will remain rare, possibly unique in spirit. It stands as proof that in a time of corporate design and consolidated production, there's still room for one person to stake a claim on the edges of possibility. For those who dream of what might be built in a shed, the PGM is both mirror and map, showing where passion can take a machine and the people who love it. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the story of the PGM V8 and want more incredible tales of motorcycle engineering, innovation, and legends from the road and track, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to SK. Your support keeps us riding forward with more untold stories, wild machines, and pure two-wheel passion. Ride safe, dream big, and stay tuned for our next story. Goodbye.